Hey, y'all. Reverend Benjamin Blankenship here with you again on Discipleship with Blankenship, episode number eight. Well, it's been a minute. I've had to sleep since uh, our uh, last episode, our seventh episode. It was all right, but I kind of, I kind of felt myself, uh, you know, the, a little bit of the tiredness kicking in. And while today isn't me talking about how we need to take it easy and we need to have a time of rest and everything like that, we get that scripturally. Um, and, and yes, it is. Uh, where we are this time, is where Jesus said, deliver us from evil and that model of prayer. Wow. Um, you know, I was watching a uh, thing with Bob Larson, love Bob Larson, love Bob Larson uh, ever since I was a young preacher, I've read so much stuff by him. And he was talking about, and it had this guy for a major like film company that would do nothing but write horror films and all that. Um, said, hey, do you have a minute? And he went up to Bob Larson and he talked to him and he said, can you tell me, you know, what evil is? I mean, you know, that Bob Larson's cast out more demons than any living person today. That's that's what he does. That's his, his thing. He pastors a church in Phoenix, Arizona and uh, does exorcisms. Uh, I love him. Uh, anyway, Bob Larson was talking about that and, and how that is, you know, for us to really understand evil, we have to understand what good is because evil is a deficient thing in good. Talked about this in the last episode, that evil is wanting the good results, but with an absence of good. So to know what good is, what God is, how God is, is to know what a deficiency of that is. The Bible tells us that with God, that he is unapproachable light, that he is light, and that there's no darkness in him. That's untrue of everything else. A laser beam has darkness in it. Sunlight has darkness in it. This is the science of it. But God is light with no darkness in him. He is perfect, unapproachable, blinding light. The word of God tells us that Lucifer, that was there, this light bringer, that's what the name would be, that he was reflecting the glory of God Almighty back to God Almighty, that he was so perfect above all the other things, only in his glory being secondary to God. And that wasn't enough for him because he wanted to be God. It said that he was so perfect until iniquity was found in him. We're not talking about a substance so much as a lack of something, that there was a lack, that, the, the, that he didn't have the game that he needed to have, that he didn't have the goodness that he needed to have, that he didn't have the virtue that he needed to have. Instead of the glory, there was an ingloriousness to him, um, bad, bad stuff right there. Um, you know, like fame, but not fame, infamy. It was, it's bad. It's a bad kind of thing. Um, and yet he knows how to project himself as good. And that's, that's what sin really does, isn't it? That's what evil really does. When you want to talk about evil, that's what it does. There was a man, um, uh, no, known as the gray man back in the, um, what was that? The early 19, uh, hundreds. And, um, he met this little girl and, um, he met her parents. And back at that time, you know, kids would have male influence people, you know, not necessarily related to them. But just like a kinder, older gentleman, just to be nice to the little kid. And people didn't think, man, there's all these creepy strangers. And he told the girl that I I'm going to take you to my niece's birthday party, if that's all right with your parents. And he met her parents, and they went ahead and let him take her to this alleged birthday party, which wasn't a thing. He, he had evil motives in mind and um he got the girl and he took her to this um this abandoned house and 
G1 and to pick some flowers out in the yard. You know, he's smiling and he's friendly. He didn't look like a monster. He didn't seem like a monster, but he was a monster. And he got her up into that house. This was after their train ride there. Um, it almost wouldn't have happened if this thoughtful little girl didn't say um, to him, Mr., you left your bag of things um, on, on the train and, and or, or bus or whatever it was that, that they went on. And um, if, he, if she would have said that, he wouldn't have had the tools that he needed to, to murder and uh, dispose of her. And he called her up into the house and she came into the house and he stepped out of her room completely nude. Now, he didn't rape her. Um, he uh, he felt like she was so perfect and he wanted her to leave this world being that way. So he he killed this poor little innocent child. Um, I used to study criminology. Uh, I really loved a Dr. Michael Stone and he was a criminal profiler and he would talk about how evil is and, you know, that there is a, um, there's several things, a checklist of what psychopaths actually have. And one of those things on that checklist is that they're charming. That's part of how they get by with doing the awful things that they're doing. Satan projects himself like an angel of light. Things that are truly evil often don't project themselves like it's this dark, creepy alley and all that. Even though there's there's an element there at some point in time, there was that element there when the girl saw the monster that that really was that had lured her that far. Poor author Stephen King, when he talked about his infamous character Pennywise, you know him, Stephen King's It. He thought to himself, how do I want this character to project himself? Well, there's there's a lot to that. Um, Stephen King's It was his um, love letter to horror. He had it emulate so many things. In the book, it, you know, have a lot of stuff from the 1950s. In the remake of the movie, they have it in the 80s for some reason that's become popular, Stranger Things and all that. You know, I'm from the 80s. I mean, it was just whatever. It's It was what it was. Um, but to, to open this up and the thing that we see Pennywise, Stephen King's it, this monster, this evil thing that feeds on fear and targets children because they're easier to scare, it portrays itself as a clown. Why? Stephen King specifically had this monster portray itself like a clown because it's so easy for a kid to trust and approach this kind, friendly clown because that's exactly the way that the devil masks himself that's exactly the way that evil masks itself it's a high it's a good time you'll feel so good you'll feel so free you'll feel so liberated but once it's got you in its clutches and you see what it is once it's once it's it's shown you its fangs and its claws and it's got you and you're in absolute terror you find that you're already in the trap like a bird you've walked into it and the spears went through your gut uh, you've you've walked into that. I mean, I know that's getting full on book of Proverbs, but you're walking into that. That's what evil actually is. As Christians, we need to have some discernment about ourselves. We need to walk in holiness. You know, the Apostle Paul said, talked about people cheapening grace. Yeah, I can do what I want to do, but I know that everything is not good for me to do. I had somebody talking to me about it the other day asking me, what does the dream mean that Simon Peter had on the roof of the house? And I know there's a lot of stupid people out there that want to say, well, that dream means you can eat anything you want to eat. That's not even what that dream was about. What that dream was about, the, the allegory, that's the word, when you're having it about one thing, but it means another. 
where Peter saw owl meat and snake meat and spider meat and pork, of course, and all these things that to him as a Jew were absolutely revolting, despicable. He said, no, Lord, God forbid, I could never eat this stuff that you're putting on a plate before me because I've never ate any unclean thing. It's unclean. And God said, don't call anything that I've called clean, unclean. If I say it's clean, it's clean. And it happened again. And it happened again. Well, in the meantime, this man who feared the Lord and gave alms to the poor and prayed this Gentile man, a Gentile, not an ethnic Jew, all right? So pagan, as far as the world would see, see him, as, as far as the church, the you know, Hebraically would see him Cornelius sent some people down there. This was a man that was on fire for God. And, and he sent these people down there to Simon the Tanner's house where Simon Peter was uh, sleeping on the roof, having this hellish dream sent from God that don't call anything unclean that I've said is clean. And here Peter was asked to go to a Gentile's house. That's not kosher. That's exactly what that dream was about. And Peter went to this man's house and he wanted to receive the, the Lord and be baptized. And the Holy Ghost came on him, fell on him just like the day of Pentecost. And he began speaking with tongues and Peter said, who am I to forbid you water? That was a sign that God accepted him. You wouldn't have a Baptist church. You wouldn't have a Methodist church. You wouldn't have a Lutheran church, a Catholic church, a Pentecostal church, any other kind of church that there has been, uh, not been, uh, you, you know, all the garbage that's went on. That's not even the deal that's went on in church history. You would not have all these Gentiles coming in if it was not for that moment, because that's when it happened. That's when it happened with the church people, Gentiles grafted into the vine. But she asked me, she said, what, what did that dream mean? And I said, that's what that dream meant. That dream meant don't say that something is unacceptable the household of Cornelius and the people that God said, I'm bringing them in. I'm calling them back. I'm calling them back from their sin, from their filth, from their paganism. And I'm calling them back. I'm calling everybody from me and that salvation is going to come from the Jews. Just like I said in my word that I'm going to use you Jews to go in to save these Gentiles and that the church will arise. Hallelujah. People look at things the wrong way so often, and that's one of Satan's greatest tricks, that he can mess with you and he can have you seen something different than it is. I'm going to say that it's all right when it's not all right at all, and they're not going to realize it till it's too late. I'm going to tell them that they have plenty of time. I'm going to tell them, you know, you don't need to worry about going all in for God right now. I'm going to talk to him about all the hurt and all the things. You know I, know, I know a preacher that had said, you know, the devil never told me that I wasn't saved until I gave my heart to him. It would have been good if he would have told me sooner. But when I started getting in the church and doing things for the Lord, he started reminding me of how bad that I really was. That's what he wants to do. He wants to mess with your mind. He will come as an angel of light and his prophets his preachers will come as preachers of righteousness too. They'll come off churchy. The Bible in the last days says these damning words. It talks about all this wickedness and all this filth and all this evil stuff. And it says having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, that word deutimus power, the same word when the Holy Ghost fell on the people and Pentecost, denying that power. It's a gospel without the power of God. It sounds preachy. It sounds churchy. It sounds right. It sounds righteous. You know, I can talk this stuff. God's gave me a new revelation. The apostle Paul said that if anybody comes with a new revelation, with a new gospel, whether it be a man, 
demon or whether it be an angel. Let them be anathema. Let them be accursed. You need to look and you need to see when something's a monster and that it's not from God, even though it paints you a pretty picture. Deliver us, Lord, from evil so we can press on and glorify you.